Thank you for tuning in to the webinar series, in case you didn't notice. My name is Pastor Darren Brake, Associate Pastor at the House of the Lord, and in case you didn't notice, is a partnership between the House of the Lord and Summit County Community Partnerships made possible with the grant from the Ohio Mental Health and Addiction Services Board. In this third installment, No One Has to Be Alone, we're going to talk about the services and resources available to people and families who are struggling with opiate use disorder. We have Jackie Pollard from Summit County Public Health and Amy Way from the County of Summit ADM Board. Stay tuned. Thank you for joining us for our webinar series. In case you didn't notice, uh, this is the third part in our series, and this one is entitled No One Has to Be Alone. Uh, in case you didn't notice, is a partnership between the House of the Lord and Summit County Community Partnerships, where we are trying to bring attention to some of the problems around substance abuse that have gone unnoticed largely uh, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, and is actually the pandemic making a lot of these issues worse. Uh, right now, we're going to have Bishop Johnson, the senior pastor of the House of the Lord. Uh, he's going to give us a few words as to why we are here and uh, open this webinar with the word of prayer. Bishop? Uh, thanks, Pastor Darren, and uh, thanks for this opportunity. And we're so excited uh, to be a part of this partnership, particularly as we talk about uh, substance abuse and its relationship to emotional health. And the church stands at the context, the crossroads between uh, emotional health, spiritual health, um, and all of those uh, kinds of various kinds of health. And so we're excited about this. I mean, because people need it. Uh, it, is a, it is a real issue right now that is uh, coming to the surface, and we hope that it'll get more attention. We have some wonderful presenters today, and we're just glad to be a part. So if you, you'd bow your heads with me briefly, Father, we thank you for this opportunity to partner with such wonderful people in order to get help to those who really need it. So we pray for our presenters today. Would you use them in a special way? And um, just make this hour very, very practical for people. Uh, we pray it in his name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Bishop Johnson. Our, uh, our first speaker, in fact, uh, we have two speakers, so you're in for a treat today. Uh, but our first speaker is Jackie Pollard. Uh, she is a licensed professional clinical counselor with supervisory endorsement, a licensed social worker, and certified chemical dependency counselor with more than 35 years of experience working in social services. Uh, she is a manager of alcohol and drug services for Summit County Health Department and is responsible for developing behavioral health programming. So at this time, I wanna introduce to you um, Jackie Pollard. Okay, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Um, and, you know, thank you, Alice and Daryl, for inviting me, being able to talk about um, harm reduction, <clears throat> excuse me, Project Dawn, and some of the efforts that we have um, been doing here. Um, I'm going to try and share my screen and make sure I get the right. Am I at the right screen here? I might need some technical assistance. If you can hang. No, it looks good, Jackie. Oh, you can see my PowerPoint? Mm-hmm. Awesome. Um, okay, so um, uh, I titled this Harm Reduction, Prevention, Not Permission, because oftentimes when people think about um, harm reduction, uh, they it kind of stirs up all sorts of feelings and thoughts about it, and uh, people are often under the misconception that um, when you offer harm reduction services or when you um, espouse that, that what you're doing is giving people permission, um, and it really isn't. It's really about prevention. Um, let me, there we go. So a couple objectives for today. I wanted everybody to be able to, um, you know, gain an understanding of what harm reduction principles and the practical applications of that. Um, being able to understand the harm reduction strategies and how it has impacted 
um, the opiate epidemic. And then um, I wanted everybody to get introduced to um, Project Dawn and um, uh, our overdose prevention efforts. So what is harm reduction? So harm reduction is kind of, uh, uh, it's an interesting thing because it's a philosophy as well as a strategy. Um, for this purpose, um, and we'll be talking a little bit about the philosophy of it, but it's really a set of practical strategies aimed at reducing the negative consequences a negative impact of some behavior. Um, harm reduction, when you think about it or you hear about it, it's typically associated with people who are using substances, but we actually do um, employ harm reduction strategies um, in all of our lives every day. The principles of harm reduction are really, um, a, it's a really a very client-centered approach. Um, that really takes into account the desires and the wishes of the participants. Um, it's really about meeting them where they are. Um, it's about advocating for people. Um, it's about um, recognizing that poverty, class, racism, isolation, trauma um, really impact people's substance use. Um, and I think most importantly, it really is about letting individuals set their own harm reduction or substance abstinence goals. Um, and then we help to, you know, help them to achieve those goals. Um, our harm reduction services are not designed to, um, you know, link people to treatment unless they want to go to treatment. Um, but that's totally at the source, uh, that's at the, you know, choice of the participant. Um, you know, harm reduction recognizes that um, substance use in our society is inevitable. Um, it's been around forever and a day, um, and it's probably not ever going to go away. So we really need to take a public health approach to it. Um, in order that we can minimize some of the potential harm and the negative consequences or impact on our communities. Again, um, harm reduction really values independent um, individual choice and the dignity of individuals. Um, we really focus on the harm. We don't, uh, not necessarily on the substance use. Um, and so we talk about how people can uh, be more safe and how our communities can be more safe. You know, bottom line is um, harm reduction, especially some of the programs, it's just about um, reducing the negative consequences associated with the behavior. Um, here's some examples of everyday, everyday examples of harm reduction. Um, some people find harm reduction, you know, when they hear about it, they get um, kind of, um, it's a little off-putting, but we use harm reduction strategies in our everyday life. We know going out into the sun is not good for us. It causes skin cancer, there's all sorts of issues with it, but we also know that people will continue to do it. So, um, you know, we tell people to make sure that you wear sunscreen. Um, you know, people who are not good swimmers, we tell people they, you know, we don't tell people to avoid water. We tell them to wear um, a life jacket. Um, using seat belts, you know, it's not practical to have everybody not never be in a car again, even though car accidents, um, you know, has a high fatality rate. So we tell people make sure that you're wearing a seat belt. Um, so those are just some kind of, um, you know, normal examples of things that we do that reduce the harm, reduce the negative impact of whatever that behavior is. Um, some examples of harm reduction on our, it, uh, as they relate to the opiates are things like the syringe exchange or a syringe access program um, where people can come and actually get sterile supplies, um, fentanyl test strips, we, we do distribute those and that is so people can 
um, actually test the, the substance that they buy to make sure it um, doesn't have fentanyl in it, which is, um, we know, so deadly. Naloxone, otherwise known as Narcan, I kind of use those terms interchangeably, um, but naloxone distribution, and we're, we're going to talk a little bit about what that is and what that does. Um, giving out condoms, vaccinations um, for people who are at risk, um, and probably the most controversial one are safe use or injection sites. Uh, to the point, and we don't actually have any of those in this country. Um, Philadelphia, Washington have 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 been trying to um, do that, but um, I, I'm not. I don't think that they've been able to get that up off the ground because of some legislation. So, um, some misconceptions about harm reduction. Um, a lot of people believe that harm reduction supports or encourages substance use. Um, and what we have actually found is that um, the research shows us that people that are invo involved in harm reduction programs are more likely to eventually stop using um, or be connected to a treatment program later on. Um, so harm reduction programs don't encourage substance use. We don't tell people here, go buy, you know, use whatever you want. But what we do do is we want people to use safely um, and responsibly. Um, you know, there's this misconception about people that they have to somehow hit bottom and have some pretty severe consequences before that they're willing to stop substances, and the research doesn't really bear that out. Um, uh, meeting people where they are, um, using evidence-based strategies are really the things that get people into treatment and on a road towards recovery. Um, what makes the opiate epidemic so much different, I've been doing um, alcohol and drug treatment for a long, long time. Um, the problem with this philosophy is, is that if we wait for people to hit bottom, the hitting bottom is typically overdose fatal deaths. Um, and, you know, as I say often, I can't really help anybody get into recovery if you're not alive. So, um, and the final um, misconception that um, I hear an awful lot is that there's this belief that harm reduction strategies are really enabling people. And then somehow we're complicit in, in, in contributing to their addiction. Reality is, is if I don't give people sterile supplies, they'll just use contaminated supplies. If I don't talk to people about their substance use, um, they will continue to use, but in an unsafe way. Um, if we don't give people Narcan or talk to them about the risks of overdosing, then, um, you know, they don't have the education. So. Um, Having the open conversation with people gives you an opportunity to build a relationship, which is what is really key in getting people into recovery, um, and really gives you an opportunity to help people um, figure out how that they can use safely um, until they're actually ready to go into treatment or get in recovery, if that ever happens. Um, but again, um, there are counties in Ohio that um, have forbidden um, syringe exchanges to happen. And, you know, what we see in communities like that is that we, uh, people don't stop using, they're just not able to use sterile supplies. So you see an uptick of things like HIV, hepatitis, um, all levels of hepatitis, um, you see an increase in things like endocarditis, uh, wound abscesses, those kinds of things, because people are not using clean supplies. Um, so what happens during an overdose? Um, you know, a lot of people think that when you overdose, um, you know, it happens immediately. And certainly um, there have been those cases of people that have overdosed and um, you know, they've, found, they've been found with a needle in their arm. 
Um, typically, though, there is a little bit of time there. Um, you know, an overdose happens because you have um, too much of a toxic substance that overwhelms the body. With opiates, what happens is, is it um, too many, when you have too much or too powerful of opiates, um, it makes people stop breathing and not responsive to stimulation, um, meaning things like sternum rubs and that kind of thing. Um, if someone can't breathe or doesn't get enough oxygen, then you know we all know that it starts impacting all of your vital um, organs, um, heart, liver, all of them. Um, and within about three to five minutes without oxygen, you end up with brain damage. So surviving an opioid overdose totally um, depends upon breathing and oxygen. Um, and again, there are some people that have, you know, um, taken some things that is so powerful, it happens immediately. But generally, um, there is a little bit of time that people uh, would be able to intervene and use some naloxone. Um, so naloxone, which is brand name Narcan, as I said, I tend to use those interchangeably. Um, but it, it has been around forever. Um, you know, at least most of my life. Um, it was patented in 1961 um, to actually treat constipation that's caused by chronic opioid, opioid use. It was approved in 71 um, as a um, medicine for opioid overdose. It's, it, it can be administered in a variety of ways, um, intravenously, which is what they typically do in the emergency room. Um, it could be in intramuscular, in your muscle. There are some auto, there is an auto injector formulation um, for overdoses where you literally just kind of stick it in your thigh and hold it there and it auto, um, it automatically um, administers Narcan. Um, and it can be used intranasally. Um, the picture here on the screen is what the nasal spray looks like. Um, it's important to note that Nox, uh, naloxone or Narcan only works on opiates. So if you're overdosing from Xanax, if you have alcohol poisoning, if whatever the substance is, it only works on opiates. Um, so, uh, and it's really, it's pretty safe. Um, it's been used for a long, long time. Um, I'll, guarantee, I'll promise you that if you've gone to the emergency room and you're unconscious and they don't know what it is, they will give you a cocktail of a variety of things and naloxone will be in that um, because it's just really effective, has very few side effects. Um, the way that it works, naloxone works, um, is it basically knocks the opiates off of the brain receptors. So whatever receptor you have that has binded to the opiates, um, naloxone comes in and basically kicks that off those receptors for as long as the medication's in your system. Um, so what that means is, is that it sends people into immediate withdrawal as long as the medication's in the system. People can fall back into withdrawal um, or back into overdose, um, which is why it's so important that we call for emergency services. Um, withdrawal is not a pleasant experience for anybody. Um, I don't know any person that signs up to do that and wants to do that because oftentimes, um, you know, it's, it's very uncomfortable. People have um, throw up, they have diarrhea, they have uh, muscle cramps, it's all sorts of things. It's not a pleasant experience, but it does, um, the naloxone will get you breathing again for as long as the, uh, the Narcan is in your system. Um, our Project Dawn, which stands for Deaths Avoided with Naloxone, is actually named after a young woman that was in Southern Ohio that had overdosed after becoming um, dependent upon opiates that were prescribed from a physician way back in the day. Um, it's an overdose prevention, education, and distribution program. 
Um, that means that we educate people on how to recognize an overdose, what to do in the case of an overdose, and we teach people how to administer um, Narcan to people that um, they think have overdosed. Um, we have, <clears throat> excuse me, a variety of clinics. Uh, we pair them often with our syringe clinics, and we have them four days a week um, and on demand. So if you call us, we can uh, get you a kit. Um, we have mail order. I would encourage everybody to go to our website. Um, you can watch a short video, be trained, and then we will actually mail you um, two doses of Narcan that you can carry. Uh, we provide Narcan for our quick response teams, and those are the initiatives of people that are going out and um, into the community and, and checking on people that have recently overdosed. We have a Leave Behind program in Akron and Barberton where um, when the EMS is uh, called on a overdose that uh, if they don't want transported, which many people don't, um, they can offer them naloxone to leave behind. They'll leave them a kit. And then the other thing we do is we often transfer um, large quantities, cases of it, to some of our community partners, um, like our, our opioid treatment programs that are giving methadone or suboxone. Uh, we provide it for the um, SUMA Health in their emergency department and Oriana House. Um, naloxone is a very, it really is a very safe drug. Um, my personal feeling is, is it should be over the counter, but you know, I'm not in charge of that. Um, but um, it should be readily accessible. There, are, there is some new legislation that's trying to make it even more accessible, um, but it is a prescribed medication, which means we have to label it to, um, you know, whoever it is that we're giving it to. Um, and it has to be, if at your organization, there has to be some kind of um, standing doctor's order to do that. We've worked with the community, our medical director, on how we can kind of make that happen um, so that we can get um, naloxone at service entities where there are people that uh, would be at risk of overdosing. Um, I included this because just kind of give you an idea of the amount of naloxone and the impact that it has. So um, the far left column or the second column is actually, um, we get funding from a variety of different sources. Um, our total number of kits, we've been passing out about 450 um, kits a month. When we pass out kits, we train people, we can give refills to people if they've used it. We also ask them um, what, uh, what was the outcome of it. So we've distributed this year a total number of uh, 2,588 kits, and that's just through August. What we have seen, though, is that we have um, 943 people that have ha have been reversed from an, an overdose as a result of the Narcan that we gave them. So when even though um, we look at the overdose rates and, and sometimes we see that ticking up, I think about, for example, in August that there was 165 people who overdosed who lived because of the Narcan. Many people don't go to the emergency room. Many people don't call anybody about it. Um, and so oftentimes the people, this 943 people are, they're not even counted anywhere. So, um, so we feel pretty comfortable. The cost of it is, it's relatively um, inexpensive, uh, comparatively speaking. And um, we think that it's, uh, you know, again, that's 943 people who have lived this year because of our um, naloxone distribution. Um, to, uh, another harm reduction strategy are syringe programs. 
Um, and the whole purpose of the syringe program is, again, to prevent the transmission of bloodborne pathogens like HIV, hepatitis, and any other infectious disease that's spread by uh, blood or body fluids. Um, the, it is an evidence-based strategy by the CDC for preventing communicable diseases, especially among people who uh, use drugs um, by IV and the people that they are in contact with. Um, there are a couple different kinds of programs. There are access programs where people can come in and just get whatever supplies they need. There's no limit on them. There are um, exchange programs that uh, for every needle that you bring back, they will give you a needle in exchange. Um, and then there's kind of that in between where, um, which is where we are. Um, we give people the amount of needles that they need. Uh, we encourage them to bring back their used needles because we don't want those being thrown in the parks and on the road. So we give them containers, Sharps containers that they can um, use and they bring those back and we actually um, just get rid of those. We um, send them through hazardous waste. So you'll see sometimes programs in different parts of the country. The West Coast tends to be more access programs and they have them um, accessibility to supplies, uh, which is kind of low barrier. Um, we're Ohio's kind of all over the place. Um, when people come into our syringe exchange or our syringe program, um, we, we are able to give them um, syringes, needles, cookers, um, tourniquets, bleach, um, cotton, um, and, you know, other supplies. Sometimes we have um, hygiene kits we're able to offer people. Um, you know, sometimes usually in the winter, we try to collect up um, gloves and socks because we know pe we have a lot of people that, some people that are homeless. Um, and um, we give out fentanyl test strips, as I said earlier, so that they can test their drugs and then make um, a, an informed choice of how to use safely by using with somebody, doing a test shot using a little bit first. We have had people who have um, said that they uh, and did not intend to buy fentanyl and so they didn't use as a result of it. Uh, we've had people who have reported to us that they have changed where who they buy from because they wanted heroin, not fentanyl. Um, so again, you know, informed decision. Um, Periodically, I'm able to have a nurse come that can also provide wound care. Um, we have recovery coaches that are actually in our program that if people are interested, they can get connected to services that way. Um, and we try to really wrap services around people to the degree that they're interested in receiving those services. Um, just a little bit of data about our syringe exchange. We have four clinics, one um, here at Fairway. Um, our Barberton Clinic opened uh, just in July. We have one at Arlington, which is our busiest. Um, and then we have a site at Kenmore. And so we've actually distributed, um, you know, over 178,000 syringes. Um, we've collected about 33,000. It's actually been more than that, but when COVID hit, we actually um, kind of stopped counting um, so that we were reducing um, the amount of time people were coming in to um, meet with us and everything and practicing social distancing. But uh, we do expect people to bring back syringes um, because that's kind of part of the the deal. We don't want people, we don't want them littering in the community. So um, we have found our best success with overdose reversal by pairing our Project Dawn with our Summit Safe. Prior to us doing that, um, our level of distribution of Narcan was really pretty low. Um, we think we found our sweet spot and um, are reaching the people that need it the most. So um, we offer everybody that comes in 
um, Narcan as well, so they can get that as well. Um, if you want more information, um, we have information on our website. Um, if you'd like a um, Narcan kit, we're happy to mail you one. You, there's a link on our website for that. Um, if you're interested in getting trained in overdose prevention, um, you know, we're able to do that as well. Um, we had prior to COVID been out in the community, but um, um, that's changed a little bit. So, um, and if you want more information, um, the Ohio Department of Health has a website all about um, injury prevention and preventing overdoses. And I encourage you to um, check out some of those resources as well. My contact information is there. Um, please feel free to give me a call or shoot me an email if you have questions. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Jackie. Um, that was a very great presentation, a lot of very useful uh, information. Uh, we're going to open this up for some Q&A, just in case any of our participants wants to ask some further questions. Um, I know one of the things that uh, that has come up is you had mentioned about the misconception about um, people who are abusing substances needing to hit rock bottom. Um, can you can you give a little bit more words to that and kind of what were some of the studies around that that kind of proved that not to be the case? Because so many people believe that 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 is, especially if they're dealing with a loved one or a family member, um, where they're like, you know what, I'm taking my hands off until they hit rock bottom. Can you speak a little bit about that? Sure. Um, I think that um, what we have learned and what the research bears out is that, you know, change is difficult from the time that we start thinking about changing till we actually implement those changes can be many, many years. And I like to use the analogy of things like, you know, when was the first time that you decided to make a change in your life, start exercising, lose weight, stop smoking? And then when did you actually implement that? Um, we used to always think that, um, you know, treatment for drugs had to be really confrontational, that um, people had to, you know, we used to tell people you have one of two choices, you can end up dead or you can end up in an institution. Um, the opiate stuff has changed that. Um, we find the most effective uh, strategy is a relationship with people. Um, and uh, being able to meet them where they are, sometimes using small incremental goals, change is hard for all of us. And so um, waiting for somebody to hit bottom with in the opiate epidemic, um, they're more likely to die than they are to hit bottom and do that. So um, making sure they have a place to live, making sure that they have, you know, support, is far more effective. Absolutely. And then the other, uh, another question we have for you is, um, how did um, harm reduction kind of come to the surface as a as a way of um, addressing substance abuse um, issues within our within our community? Um, uh, was it kind of late than other practices, or kind of how did that come come to the surface? I. Well, as I said, um, Narcan has been around forever. Well, not forever, but since 61, which is all of my life. Um, and um, I think it rose to where it is now because um, when the opiates Im impacted everybody, it changed the alcohol and drug world. In the mm -hmm. past, you typically had people who were more likely to use cocaine, marijuana, alcohol, maybe pills, um, and um, harm reduction, Narcan doesn't work on any of that. When the opiates hit, um, you know, people, especially in Summit County, people were dying at such a high rate that, um, you know, the initiative was focused on how do we push out enough Narcan um, so that we can just start saving people's lives. So. Um, I think the harm reduction, we, you know, the more that it's been studied, the more we've seen um, it is enables uh, us to reduce the number of HIV cases. There was a, you know, kind of a famous case in Indiana 
where one person was responsible for an entire HIV outbreak. Um, wow. Stuff is highly contagious. Hepatitis is, it's really expensive. It costs you about $300,000 a year to treat hepatitis C versus $75 for a Narcan kit and or $12 for um, syringe exchange supplies. So that's some of it. There's an economy there. So Okay. All right. Well, thanks again um, for your time um, and for this useful information. Um, next, we're going to, I'm going to introduce our next speaker uh, for this webinar, and that is uh, Amy Wade. Uh, Amy is Associate Director of Clinical Services at the County of Summit Alcohol, Drug Addiction, and Mental Health Services Board, where she has served for nine years. Uh, in this position, she manages the Department of Behavioral Health Clinicians and Research Experts. Uh, thank you for joining us today, Amy, uh, and I will put the webinar in your hands. Thank you. Are you all able to view my PowerPoint? All right, thank you very much. Thank you again, everyone, for having me. Um, just wanna talk a little bit about the resources that are in the community. Uh, I work for the Alcohol, Drug Addiction and Mental Health Services Board, and I've been with the board for um, going on 10 years now. However, I've been working within the system in Summit County area for over 20 years, working in community corrections in various county courts. Um, so I'm familiar with the impact of substance use disorders in, in various ven venues and how it affects families and youth um, and everyone across the lifespan, whether you're actively engaged or you're just related or you know tangential to someone struggling with substance use disorders. So I just wanna talk a little bit about the ADM board, what we're called for short, if you're not familiar and what our role is in the community and how you can get attached to resources and get involved. So the Alcohol, Drug Addiction, and Mental Health Services Board, um, one of our many roles in the community is to ensure that folks are aware of substance use and mental health disorders and recognize that um, they are chronic medical diseases. They are chronic disorders that should be treated as such. Um, our goal is to try to reduce the stigma around those things so folks are able to talk about when they are struggling and they are able to get connected to resources in the community, recognizing that treatment and supports are available and people can recover from these, these disorders. We fund, monitor, and evaluate prevention, treatment, and recovery services within Summit County across approximately uh, 20 plus providers in the community, and that's across the lifespan. So we're providing treatment um, to, for maternal depression and other services prior to children being born and their parents um, all the way to older adulthood. We receive federal, state, and state dollars to fund some of these services, but the majority of the funds that we push out into the community for our providers are um, through the support of local levy dollars that Summit County residents have found to be important to make sure these supports are available within Summit County. Um, our over, of our overall budget, 90% of our budget are, is pushed out into the community for community services um, for our citizens to be able to take advantage of. We try to ensure that there's equitable access for anyone who is in need of support and services regardless of their ability to pay. Um, so we target those who are uninsured, um, underinsured, to be able to support them getting into access for services. Also, Medicaid and some of the commercial insurance providers don't, do not pay for many of the services that are evidence-based and proven to help support people through treatment and recovery. So while there's a lot of things through Medicaid expansion that are, are you know, substance abuse treatment services that are supported by Medicaid and covered by Medicaid, some of the things that I'll talk about today, you'll see are things that are kind of those su supportive and supplemental services that are proven to kind of supplement that to help people retain recovery and stay in, and stay in recovery. So as I mentioned, we provide funding to over 20 treatment providers. Um, our offices are actually 
located in West Akron, but we do not provide direct services. We fund the agencies that you see on your screen today, and this is just a few of them um, that you may have heard of and may have some familiar, familiarity with, um, like Summit Psychological Associates, Oriana House, um, the Akron UMADOP, which is the Urban Minority and Alcoholism Drug Abuse Outreach Program, um, CHC Addiction Services, Greenleaf, Greenleaf Family Center, and so on and so forth. So all of these agencies are treatment providers in our community, and the vast majority of them provide co-occurring treatment services, which means they're able to address mental health and substance use disorder issues, which is the ideal scenario, because so many times within these situations, you, you're unable to determine you know, what causes which, uh, what comes before the other, um, and a lot in more more cases than not, they coexist. So specifically to substance use disorder services, some of the treatment services that you would see that these agencies are providing would be diagnostic assessment, which is your first entry into the door um, to identify what your issues are and what your needs are to de determine what level of treatment service you might need. Uh, medication assistant treatment, specifically for opiate use disorder, is one that many of our providers utilize to help with recovery from substance use disorder and specifically opiates. Um, individual counseling is available, group counseling, case management, um, when you get to a higher level of services, you're looking at intensive outpatient treatment services, which is an array of services provided for an extended period of time um, over several days during the week. Um, partial hospitalization service. We have a whole, a whole array of services before you get to residential treatment. Because what we found when you, generally when folks are assessed, um, we can accommodate their needs in an outpatient setting, which allows them to remain in the community, re remain connected to their families, um, continue to be employed and do the things they need to do on a, a daily basis. Um, when you get into residential treatment, it's really high intensity services where folks are 24 seven within a facility really receiving that intensive treatment and 24 seven access to services and clinical staffing. So. A lot of times what we find is family members, especially when their loved ones are entrenched in the throes of substance use disorder, that's what they want them to go, that's what they're, they want them to do, but there's really a process to seeing kind of what dosage of service is most effective for what that person is experiencing. And that diagnostic assessment actually helps us determine um, what level of service that they actually need. But we try to do a really good job of trying to put all other avenues and all other interventions in place before we get to the point where folks need residential treatment. But if they do, that is something that's available, like I said, regardless of ability to pay for that, um, the ADM board funds those services in the community. So on the other side of treatment services, I just wanted to touch on recovery support services. Because as I mentioned, recovery supports and being in treatment, is it's a lifelong process. A substance use disorder is a chronic disease. And there are things that you have to wrap around individuals when they're in recovery and to be able to sustain recovery. Once you're a person in recovery, um, you, don't, you never become a person no longer in recovery unless you relapse. You're, you're in recovery for the rest of your life. And there are things just like with other chronic diseases that you have to think about and maintain in your lifestyle. So one of the things that we provide um, through the board is free training for those who are in recovery and want to work in the field as peer recovery support specialists. There's actually a statewide certification uh, for peer recovery support specialists for folks who have lived experience who want to work in the field and give back and be supportive to others who are walking that same path. So we offer three free trainings, at minimum three free trainings a year, which is a 40 hour training for folks to get the statewide certification to be able to work in the field. It's an industry recognized certification um, that folks can apply for jobs within the field and be able to give back in that way. Peer recovery support specialists embedded in the agencies. I think Jackie mentioned their use of some of these staff as well. 
Historically, they had not been funded by Medicaid. Most recently, Medicaid has started to cover um, reimbursement for that particular staff and service within substance use disorder providers. Um, they're also available within mental health agencies as well, but when they are not supported or in their, they're working in non-traditional settings or um, things of that nature, that is something that the board also helps to fund, recognizing the importance of having someone available who's walked that path and can speak to that experience and help support others as they um, travel their path to recovery. Recovery housing is something else that the board supports and we fund in the community that's available to those in recovery. Um, coming out of residential treatment programs, Jackie mentioned some of those, you know, basic life needs that people need to remain in recovery, like housing. So we recognize that. So there are several agencies that we fund in the community to be able to provide that, like Legacy 3, Freedom House for Women, Truly Reaching You. Um, Orienta House also has some recovery housing as well that's funded in the community. So we recognize that housing is one of those basic needs, you know, to be able to be successful. successful. Finally, have recovery family supports. I'm sorry, and I wanted to make sure to put that out there because that is critical um, for those who have loved ones, um, friends and family that are struggling with substance use disorders. Um, Unfortunately, we with co with the COVID environment, some of those resources have been put on hold, but they're slowly ramping up. For instance, Orienta House, they host a Family Matters program, which is for family members and those engaged in their programs to kind of talk about the recovery process um, and try to build those relationships and strengthen those relationships because they're very important to recovery. So they're in the process of trying to get that back um, on board when it's a safe way to bring people back together. But other resources that you can access online and find out about is, uh, say, like Al-Anon, which is for family members of those with um, alcoholism, or Naranon is another family member engagement support group for those um, who have family members struggling with narcotics addiction, opiate addictions. There's various support groups that you can find online. Um, after some review, I discovered that there are some still being held locally in person, but there are also some virtual options. So if that's something that you think would be helpful to you, I would strongly encourage you to go out and look for those because it's important when you're dealing um, with someone else's addiction that you make sure you're taking care of yourself. It can just be just as draining and stressful as you try to care for that loved one and worry about that loved one. And it can have a toll on individuals that are attached to that person as well. And you have to create boundaries and create self-care for yourself as well as you walk that journey alongside them. One thing I want to add as well is Jackie mentioned the quick response teams. And I wanted to throw that in as another recovery support. Um, they actually go out when they are aware in about seven communities across Summit County with EMS, law enforcement, and peer recovery support specialists or substance use, substance use disorder counselors that the board funds to go out and follow up in, to households and locations where there's been an identified overdose. And it's just another outreach into the community um, where, you know, when certain folks are showing up at your door, whether it be EMS or law enforcement, it's not in response to a crisis or emergency, um, but it's like-minded folks that's really there just to help and provide resources and to help people identify where they can go to get help in real time and try to provide that support and let them know that we continue to care. Um, we found that particular program to not only be beneficial to the families and the folks who have overdosed and are in need, and recovery, are in need of treatment and recovery resources, but also to those professionals that are going out who many times find that, you know, the other, only time they're seeing people are in their worst circumstances. And it's rewarding when you can go out and connect with someone and see them after, you know, you, you've saved their lives, you've kept them alive, and you're able to help them get into treatment. And they're able to see that you care beyond that, that crisis point because it can be exhausting for our first responders and others um, as they go out and sometimes repeatedly go out, you know, to see the same individuals that are struggling with addiction. But once you get to that point where they're ready for treatment and you can be part of that, it's definitely rewarding. So again, that's a resource that we've made available um, within many of the communities across the county that respond to overdoses.
So the major thing that I want to impose, and, and we had a campaign, especially over the course of the past six months, is, is that behavioral health is open for business. Um, so many things shut down in the midst of this COVID pandemic. Um, we were able to work with our providers to make sure that they maintain capacity to serve our most vulnerable populations that are dealing with mental illness and substance use disorders. Many of our providers now have a, a kind of a hybrid type model. Um, everyone's up to speed and able to add or to provide telehealth services. There are also some capacity to have in-person services. Most folks are in various stages of the hybrid of telehealth and, and in-person services, but they are available. So what I'm impressing upon folks is, you know, reach out. The support is there, the help is there, the treatment is there. There's various platforms to how people feel comfortable in getting it. What we've seen is the folks that are engaged, um, telehealth has actually been a very positive thing. These folks can stay within the comfort of them, their own home and get these interventions that are very much needed. So this is creating greater access um, and greater comfortability, but the agencies are definitely, um, they have their um, protective personal, protective equipment available. They have cleaning protocols and all types of things that we're helping to support to make sure everyone's ready to accommodate folks however they need to be accommodated um, because this is just not something that we can shut down. This is a service that had to be maintained just as any other healthcare because it, it is a life or death matter in many situations as Jackie has mentioned. So how can you get help? Um, you'll see a, a picture there, one of our campaigns that we did a couple of years ago, uh, Recovery is Worth the Fight. We created the ADM Addiction Helpline. So that number there is for our helpline, which is run by Akron Summit Community Action, where you can call in and they have connections to um, many treatment providers across our community that are ready, willing, and able to schedule appointments in real time as folks call into this agency. Um, you will get someone on the line during the hours that are presented. They will ask you a few questions to find out what your issues are, what type of services you need, um, where you're located, and try to make sure to get you attached to the most appropriate provider that seems as though they can meet your needs, um, that may be in close proximity to where you can access the services, but they really try to go through and, and walk folks through the process and do a warm handoff to that agency. Um, we're looking at next day appointments in most cases where folks can get in and get assessed and get the services they need. So I highly encourage folks um, to take note of that number and know that that's a resource to them. An additional resource is our support hotline that's man manned by Portage Path Behavioral Health. And that's a 24-7 crisis intervention and supportive listening hotline. Um, if you call any of these numbers at any given time, they will get you connected to the service that you need to get connected to. But the support hotline, it just if you need to talk about things, if you need to talk about the stressors that's going on, where you can get help, or just a kind ear, someone to listen, to you know what you may be struggling with, you can call the crisis support hotline at 434-9144, and that's 24-7. Another 24-7 service is our ADM Crisis Center, which is manned by the Orienta House, and that's located in the North Acre, the North Hill area on 15 Frederick Avenue. And there they provide detox services, and they provide both inpatient and outpatient detox services. So when I say outpatient detox services, um, through medication-assisted treatment and supervision, um, folks can come in for a regimen on an outpatient basis and visit the facility on a number of days, however designated, to be able to go through the detoxification. Um, program, but that that's when people have safe, stable housing that they can go to on a regular basis, or they do have an inpatient DDOCS program as well. One resource that I did not mention was the SUMA First Step program as well as a 24-7 resource. So I know on their Barberton campus, at any point in time, you can walk into that emergency room and that ER 
and get support. They will get you started on what you need to go into treatment if you're so desired. So that is definitely another value add to our community and our treatment resources that's available on a 24 seven basis. Um, you can't time schedule or predict when someone is ready to go into treatment, but when that time comes, we're gonna make sure there's resources available and someone ready to receive them and get that started. So those are definitely resources that we wanna make sure the community is aware of. So how can you get involved? If you're just, if you have personal experience with this or with a loved one, or you just want to be able to be involved, um, to be able to give back and support the community because there are volunteers and those um, vested and interested parties in the community community are our most valuable resource and asset to combating all of this um, is join the opiate and addiction task force they actually just had a meeting this week of community members kind of giving us up-to-date um, kind of current state of affairs for community members the next meeting is scheduled for december 2nd uh, for 4 to 5.30, those meetings have been being held virtually. You'll see the website there posted on your screen. Um, and hopefully, Alice will be able to get the, the handouts to you all so you can have this to be able to take with you. But visit that website, summitcountyaddictionhelp.org. What you will find on that website is you can sign up for the email list for the Opiate Addiction task force, you can read the meeting notes from previous meetings and see the data dashboard of what's going on in our community. And you can also sign up for subcommittees. So there are subcommittees that get together in between these uh, quarterly task force meetings and they, they do the work. They dig in and they do the work and address the needs of the community. The whole group is currently engaged in a strategic planning process to make sure we update our strategies and we're targeting the areas of need in the community. So if you want to get involved, by all means, go to that website and sign up. We'd be glad to have you. And another resource I just wanted to mention is our Change Direction Summit County Faith Subcommittee. Um, this committee has been in operation for over five years. And it was a broader initiative um, just to reduce stigma around mental health and helping folks to recognize the five signs that someone may be suffering. You'll see the graphic there, know the five signs such as personality changes, mood changes, withdrawing or diminishing self-care or hopelessness. And I can say out of the broader initiative, our faith subcommittee has been the most faithful um, and steadfast group that continues to meet on a monthly basis. Um, it's a great opportunity for our behavioral health provider uh, community and our faith community to come together and share resources, um, recognizing that we all have a role to play and making sure we're culturally competent and aware and how we're you know, providing treatment and faith services and aware of each other's resources and, and building those relationships where we can reach out and call one another um, when we have questions or we need to get people that we serve connected or make sure they have the appropriate spiritual support or clinical support. So again, you can find information about the Change Direction Faith Subcommittee on the ADM Board website. So I encourage you to go there and visit. You can see some of the resources we have available, um, some of the events that we have held, and also get a bit information about our next meetings. Um, our next meetings actually, there are, we meet every third Wednesday of the month at 8.30 in the morning. So if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out if you wanna get on that mailing list that is available as well. What you'll see here is a screenshot of our website. Everything that I covered today, you can find on that website. All of those agencies I've listed, you can go and look at those agencies, see what type of services they can provide, or you could just call the helpline or the hotline. You can call any one of those numbers. So there's various avenues for you to get support at what you need at our website, www.admboard.org. I don't have my contact information listed there, but you can find me on that website as well. So thank you. Thank you, Amy. This was a, a great presentation. Um, a lot of good uh, practical um, information here. In fact, uh, the questions that I had uh, that came through, you answered throughout the course of, of your presentation. So we actually don't have any questions for you because you took care of it already. So. Uh, thank you for thank you for that, and just thank you for uh, your willingness to get on here um, and take out your time 
uh, to share such useful information. Uh, in closing, I do have a couple of announcements. Uh, there is uh, one more, um, our fourth installment in our, in case you didn't notice, webinar series that will be next Friday, uh, September 25th from 12 to 1 p.m. Uh, this will be a panel discussion uh, featuring Bishop Joey Johnson of the House of the Lord, Kemp Boyd of Love Akron, uh, Dr. Michael Forbes of Akron Children's Hospital, and Eric Malone from SUMA Center for Health Equity. Uh, and the topic on this one will be, in case you didn't notice, uh, COVID-19, opiate use disorder, and the faith community. Uh, you will be able to register for that. Uh, there will be a link to coming to you in your email once this webinar is over with. Uh, also want to make you aware that tomorrow um, at the House of the Lord from 1 to 3, uh, we're located at 1650 Diagonal Road. Uh, there will be a resource event uh, for people who are in uh, struggling with recovery, looking to recover. Uh, we'll, there will be plenty of resources here. Uh, so we wanted to make sure that we did not just have a webinar about it, but we provided a uh, physical opportunity for you to drive through uh, and get in touch with resource providers. Uh, we will also be passing out, uh, naloxone will be distributed there, uh, along with uh, some food and groceries will be handed out as well. So uh, spread the word, let people know to come by uh, the House of the Lord uh, tomorrow from 1 to 3, uh, and our address is 1650 Diagonal Road. Uh, I want to thank you uh, for taking the time to join us for this third installment of our webinar series, in case you didn't notice. Uh, have a great weekend. Take care.